Amen, amen. We're turning in our Bible this morning to the book of Revelation. Turn me to Revelation, the 13th chapter. Revelation 13th chapter in the last book of your Bible. Revelation 13. Revelation 13, beginning with verse 15. Revelation 13, beginning with verse 15. Our topic this morning is the economics of the end time. The economics of the end time. We're in Revelation 13 and verse 15. Reading verses 15 through 17. This familiar passage of scripture should not be uncommon to most, even those that don't understand the end times. It's been read and spoken of in many settings, both religious and not. But we're going to study some of this as it pertains to, again, the economics of the end and draw out a prophetic line of study that we must understand carefully as we trace down the events, the rapid movements of the final prophecies of the Lord. In Revelation 13 and 15 it says this, it says, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he called us all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now there's much in that passage that we can draw out and look at in numerous studies, and we have. But again, we want to focus and drill down to number 17 and notice that beside the death decree, which is a punishment for not receiving and worshiping this image and also receiving this mark, the Bible says in verse 17, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. In our previous study, we found what this mark is and even what this image is, and we see that this legislation of this false Sabbath is going to be a test, a religious test, allowing entrance into or causing exclusion from a central closed economy. The idea of a closed economy in America, in any country, for many years, even for centuries, has thought, been thought to have been almost impossible. Because of the use of things like gold and silver and precious metals, and even the idea of bartering, and also the idea of paper money, paper federal notes, the idea of closing the economy to the use of money when money was so fluid seemed impossible. But in our day that we're living in, we're seeing that this prophecy is so old as the Bible, given to us hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, is showing us in our time how possible it is, and how even prophetic, how it will come to pass. The Bible says these individuals in the last days, in the last hour of verse history, are going to be forced by punishment of death and also by economic sanction, economic embargo to receive the mark of the beast and the worship this image. We'd like to take our time this morning and look at a few prophetic lines of study, but we can see and understand from Revelation 13 and from Daniel and various chapters, these economic principles of the end that play so largely in the closing up of this earth's history and how the Bible outlines to us this idea of a closed, centralized economy centered in the papal power and administrated by the governments of this earth while all these powers are coming together to persecute, prosecute, and to sanction the people of God, the people that refuse to receive this mark and worship this image and to receive the number of his name. This is another prophecy that helps us understand this same truth spoken of in Daniel's prophecy in the 11th chapter of Daniel. Look at Daniel 11 quickly. Daniel 11. And let's see if we can draw down some time periods to show us how this comes down to our day. We're in the 11th chapter of Daniel. 11th chapter. Daniel 11, beginning with verse 40. Daniel 11 and verse 40. This passage we're told in the pen of inspiration is designed, calculated by God, to cause a great revival among God's people. Thusly, we see it either not spoken of on one side or presented in erroneous fashions and ways on the other. But there must come a revival through the study of the books of Daniel and Revelation and especially the book of Revelation, sorry, Daniel 11. In the book of Daniel 11, look at verse 40 and let's see if we can draw back our minds to where and how we see this prophecy unfolding here and we look at the work of the papal power, if you remember our previous studies, in the verses, I'll say verse 30, verse 30, 
8 or so, I should say, maybe 36, 37, all the way down to verse 40. We're seeing the papal power. From those verses all the way down, we're seeing the papacy as the king of the north, the spiritual Babylon, the king of the north, doing exploits. But notice in verse 40 what happened. In verse 40 of Daniel 11 it said, And at the time of the end, that the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a... In these few words, we see a span of hundreds of years. In Daniel 11, 40, it said at the time of the end, and we've understood from the study of Daniel what the time of the end means. The time of the end, when our previous studies found, told us that the time of the end is the termination of the papal supremacy. Papal supremacy would go from 538 to 1798. This is a matter of history, and also we've seen it in the book of Daniel, chapter 12. It's been clearly outlined to us in our previous studies. In the understanding there, if we look at Daniel 11:40, when the Bible said at the time of the end that the king of the south shall push at him, we're looking to see around the year 1798 some type of military aggression against the papacy. How do we know that? Because we've already seen in various scriptures, especially Daniel's 7th chapter, that the idea of pushing and denotes military power. Remember the he-goat and the ram? Amen. And they were pushing one with another. And we found in the very chapter, Daniel chapter 7, that the he-goat represents what power? Greece. Amen. And the ram represents what? Media and Persia. And we see the contention between these two powers for world dominion and then pushing represents military aggression and military conquest. Was there any type of military or violent aggression by the king of the south? Or what we understand as spiritual Egypt from the 11th chapter of Revelation toward the papacy? Or what we know as the French Revolution and the powers there? Was there any aggression by the French Revolution toward the papacy? In 1798, the, the, the emperor or so-called emperor uh, Napoleon sent his general birth here to the papacy or to the Vatican and took the Pope off his throne and brought him into exile out of the Vatican and put him in jail. There was military aggression put forth against the papacy. And because of that, the papacy received what the 13th chapter of Revelation calls a deadly wound. Why? Because, interestingly enough, remember in 508, you Bible prophecy students and history students, remember in 508, it was the king of France who was the one who was the agent to pluck up those three horns by which the papacy came up. The Vandals, the, all these individuals were plucked up by France, by the French king. And this French king that was instrumental, or France that was instrumental in plucking up and making way for the papacy in 1798 was the same power under the auspice of this French Revolution that was going to put down the papacy. Isn't that interesting? But even more so, we know this is the time cue of what we're looking at, what time we're looking at in Daniel 11 40. The year 1798 when this took place, exactly as prophecy states. However, the Bible said in Revelation 13, and I'm sure you're familiar with this, that this deadly wound received by the papacy would be healed. So would the papacy continue to stay in this is not stage or this stage where the civil powers of the world have divorced themselves from her and she has no civil power to work through to persecute and prosecute the people of God? Would it happen for her? That wound would be healed. That separation between church and state would be <clears throat> regained and she would come back again. So in the 11th chapter of Daniel and verse 40 it says this. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. What does chariots, horsemen, and ship represent in the Bible? Military power. Again, chariots are used in war, right? Horsemen used in war and ships. Now, I'll also let you know, and we studied this before, that chariots, horsemen, and ship also represent also economic power because ships also represent merchants. Merchants. Would the king of the north come back and attack a power directly birthed from the French Revolution in years later, in 1989? What's the child of the French Revolution? What are the, the modern equivalents of the French Revolution in our day that continue? Are they not communism? 
socialism. They have the same idea, the Marxist value. All these things come from the teachings that spawned the French Revolution. And this power known as communism, along with this sister, socialism, had gone over the entire world. A great proportion of the world was controlled under the Iron Curtain, the Soviet Union at one time called, the China, the communist China, right? Parts of Africa, Cuba, all the world was afraid of this communist power, this communist threat, and also its socialistic sister that took its way across Europe. Remember, you know what the term Nazi actually stands for in, its, in the original language? National Socialist Party. While they were fascist in nature, their term or their title was the National Socialist Party that almost took over the entire world under Adolf Hitler. We're talking about a power that the Bible identifies even in the 11th chapter of Revelation coming out of the bottomless pit. That's not our study tonight. We're talking about the economics of the end. And we're seeing that in 1989 through 1991, a onslaught of attacks highlighted and headed by both America and the papacy, the king of the north, in connection, again, the America, a civil power to work through, and the papacy, this woman of Revelation 17, this mystery Babylon, Revelation 18, this power that we see as the king of the north in the 11th chapter of Daniel, in unison, again, that deadly wound starting to heal now, is seen to come back, not only come back, but come back like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen. Do you remember, maybe you don't, in the time of 1989, 88, Ronald Reagan had what they call Star Wars. And started to build up the military, the chariots and horsemen of the U.S. military. And there was what's called the arms race, the space race. And because of the idea of America building up its nuclear and surface to air and naval and uh, ground troop forces, even trying to create a, a Star Wars type of, of missile system to shoot down nuclear weapons in the sky, Russia tried to keep up with the arms raised, and it broke their economy. You don't know that. Ships, ships also represent merchants, economic power and military power. Also, there are various things going on in Europe. You probably don't remember uh, solidarity, the solidarity movement with, with Lech Walesa, and how in Poland, the very nation that the Pope at the time came from, there was a social movement that was arising to try and throw off the papal power. And one by one by one, seemingly overnight, the Iron Curtain fell. Poland and Czechoslovakia, all these nations fell one by one by one. Popular or rise of uprisings on the streets. The economics of the nation of Soviet Union that fed these nations crumbled, causing a ripple effect through these other economies. So the economies crumbled, social uprisings, and through various means, we found out in Tam Magazine Secret meetings, secret funnelings of, of, of funds, even starting and fomenting some of these uprisings, causing these agents of these various countries to try and implement aggressive spending to try and break their economy. All this was, according to Time Magazine, highlighted, planned out, and strategically implemented by John Paul II with the help of Ronald Reagan. Time Magazine outlined it all for us. When this take place? 1989 through 1991. The Soviet Union eventually fell and went into disarray and is now seeming to <laughs> revive. This happened in 1989. So where are we in prophecy right now according to Daniel 1140? We're down to 1990s now. How long ago was 1990s? We'll do some math. 30 years. 30 years ago. In the lifetime of some of you people here. Some of you are too young. There's a few of us here that remember 1989, 1990. 30 years ago, the prophecy of Daniel 11 has taken us at least 30 years ago. Now remember, what was our topic this morning? Economics. The economics of the end. So when we're talking about Revelation 13, and we see this idea of a centralized economic power under the papacy, controlling all the economics, and having not only a death decree, but an embargo or a sanction against anyone that does not receive this worship of the false day of worship, or this false Sabbath, we can bring it down to 1989. What do you say? How, why do you say that? Well, in Daniel 11:40, we see these events of the King of the North coming back have taken place already. Congress had already fallen at the hand of this power in 1989, 1990. That's a time cube. 
What does Daniel 12 verse 1 say? Daniel 12 1 says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, that great prince will stand up for the children of his people, and there shall be a time of trouble as a never was that there was a nation and the people shall be delivered. Amen? Amen? And we know that this idea of Daniel standing up is the close of probation. And we're talking about the great time of trouble in Daniel 12 and verse 1. We're not there yet. Probation has not closed yet. Michael has not stand up yet. So we're looking at a period between 1990 and the close of probation now. We look at the idea of where we're looking in this prophetic scheme. Amen? Amen. Now, are we in 1990? We're after 1990, right? And we're before Michael stands up. How do we know? Look at Daniel chapter 11, verse 43. Because something must happen after 1990 and before Michael stands up. Look what it says here. In Daniel 11, in verse 43, it says this. Talking about the king of the north, right, who is resurging, going to the countries, has already entered into the glorious land and done according to his will. In verse 43 of Daniel 11, it says this. Daniel 11, 43 says, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over the precious things of Egypt. Now, what does that mean? What does the king of the north have here? You said what? Money, wealth, gold and silver. Let's put a text with that. What does it mean when you have these treasures of gold and silver? Or treasuries. Are we talking about literal Egypt? A local kingdom? Or are we talking about, in these passages of Daniel 11, 40 to 45, future spiritual worldwide emphasis here? Not a local treasury, but the treasury, the economics of the entire World. Look at the text quickly. In the book of Isaiah. Hold your finger in Daniel 11 and look at the book of Isaiah 39. Isaiah the 39th chapter. Isaiah 39. We're talking about the economics of the end time. Isaiah 39. Isaiah 39. Remember Hezekiah? Mm -hmm. You don't remember Hezekiah. You remember Hezekiah? Yes. Hezekiah was a king of the people of God. Israel, right? And remember, literal local, future spiritual worldwide. Future spiritual worldwide according to the symbols and principles of literal local stories in history of the Old Testament. In the 39th chapter of Isaiah, notice a story that we see here that has future worldwide spiritual implications as we see Daniel 11 talking about the king of the north or the spiritual Babylon having control of the gold and silver. Follow me now. In Isaiah 39 it says this. It says in verse 1, at that time, that's interesting even saying that, at that time, Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, the king of Babylon, sent letters and presents to Hezekiah, for he had heard that he had been sick and was recovered. And Hezekiah was glad of them. Because these merchants or these emissaries from Babylon came to Jerusalem. Hezekiah, verse 2, was glad of them and showed them the house of his precious things. Precious things. Same term, right, of Daniel 11. Precious things. What was he showing him? It says, silver and gold, spices and precious ointment and all the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasure. treasure or his treasury. All the economics were shown and revealed to these men of Babylon. And there was nothing in his house nor his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. Now, brothers, you know the rest of the story. Amen. amen. These things were shown unto Babylon, and where did all these treasures, all the gold, all the money, all the silver, all the riches of Jerusalem end up as they were shown to these emissaries of Babylon? Babylon. They end up in Babylon. As a matter of fact, he drank in them, he worshipped in them, he had debaucherous parties with these implements of gold and silver. All that was shown, all that was in the house of the people of God, people of God were taken to Babylon. Babylon had a control of the gold and the silver. Literal Israel, future spiritual worldwide emphasis, Babylon would control all the gold and silver, all the treasuries of the earth would be in the power of this religious, geopolitical power. This is a prophecy of the end time. You said this is impossible. How could that, how could that even be? That doesn't even make sense. Neither does a power that actually is virtually almost two centuries old have the ability to have such an influence on modern media has such a, 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 a trending pattern on all social media platforms 
NBC, ABC, Twitter, Instagram, the Pope and his activities are trending. Name any other institution so old with such a modern and, and too up to date trending pattern on social media today. Name one. Name any geopolitical power that has been able to survive the vicissitudes of the world and try to relate to this earth to succeed and to reinvent itself as the papacy has done. Not so uh, hard to believe if you have a prophetic worldview. Not so hard to believe you understand Daniel 11 and Revelation 13 that this power must have this deadly wound healed, must come back, and the Bible says it must eventually have control over the gold and silver of Egypt or the entire world. It must control the treasury, the economics of the whole world, the economics of the end before the close of probation. Are we still together? We're talking about the economics of the end and we want to understand that we are not in 1989. We are racing toward, we are coming toward this Fulfillment, because this fulfillment, this work must be ready and in place for there to be a Sunday law. Now you say, well, I'm glad that you said that because we got some time, brothers and sisters. Any of you flown an airplane lately? We went to Dallas, Philip and I, or when we went to, where we just go to Greenville. Oh, you, you're probably sleeping, but when the lady comes through or the general comes through, the store, the stewardess, Say you want a box of crackers, or some water, or some juice, something like that. You think you pull out a dollar bill and give it to them? I trow not. You're going to be thirsty. They may give you some water. You can't. Well, I, there are, I'm saying this is universal yet, but the greatest airlines of America, a great majority of Delta, JetBlue, United, you cannot use cash on the plane anymore. You have to use a car. Now, if you want some water, they'll give you some water. They'll give you a little drink. But you want one of those snack boxes? I try not. You want uh, wh whatever that, you cannot get it without a credit card, without swiping your card and being digitally connected to the financial markets through that plastic strip. And uh, you know, we last night, we did a study and we found out that Satan, according to Isaiah 14, 14, wants to be like the Most High. Didn't we find that? And, I, I, you know, this is not, now, now I'm going to deviate for a little bit. This is, this is John Cofer speaking here. I'm not going for the Bible. But I thought it was interesting. This is, I thought, let's see, parallel. I thought it was interesting that when we look at what, how the world is moving today, it seems like what's happening in the sky is ahead of what's happening on the earth. It seems like the skies or the places where the planes are flying are going digital, are going cashless. Even at a faster rate, as far as the United States is going, at a faster rate than the ground. Here in America, we have not gone cashless yet. There's, I don't know of any store that does not receive cash, except for the Amazon stores that they're making now. And some stores are trying to test it, but largely, there's no cashless, real strong infrastructure here. It's prepared, but it's not here yet. You notice how Publix now has this thing where you can actually call and they'll actually do your grocery shopping for you. And basically you just give me your card and basically they shop for you and they'll either drop it at your house or you just come and you park and they bring it out to your car and give it to you and boom, you do, 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 and you're gone. No money, no money. You can go to the store now and you can actually go to check it out yourself. You take a little thing, beep, 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 swipe the right card and you're out. The infrastructure is in place. But the idea that this stuff is happening above before it happens below, I thought was interesting. Because again, Satan, Satan has a sense of humor, brothers and sisters. I believe Satan has a sense of humor. And when the Bible says that I will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and the skies, where the heavens, where, where the planes are flying, are going cash so fast, and Satan wants his will to be done on the earth as it already is becoming so cashless in heaven, brothers and sisters, I think he has a sense of humor. I think he's laughing at the fact that many people don't understand that what's going on in the airlines is soon going to land. It's soon going to be seen all over the world. And it must especially begin here in America. That's why you see the majority of the American airlines 
are going cashless and entertaining this idea of a cashless environment in the sky. Now, brothers and sisters, that may be a, a, a reach or a, 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 a tangential issue that has nothing to do with the prophecy. But when we look at the prophecy, get back to the word of God, we understand this is coming. This must happen because the prophecy states that the gold and silver, the economic, the treasuries, the, the, the financial powers of this world must be in the hand, must be controlled by the papal power in order for it to enforce this mark, in order to enforce this, this embargo, this sanctioning of the people of God who refuse to receive this mark. It must be in place. But let's go, again go further in the scripture and see how the Bible continues in various passages and chapters to show this truth. And we're now going to the book of Revelation 18. Look at Revelation 18 quickly. In Revelation 18, let's see if we can understand this even clearly as again the Bible shows us more of this idea of economics in the end time in the 18th chapter of Revelation. Revelation 18. Revelation 18 chapter. And let's drop down to verse 3. Revelation 18 and verse 3. Please say amen when you have that. Amen. Speaking about the economics of the end. We're in Revelation 18 and verse 3. Babylon controls and influences the governments of this world and the economics of this world. We want to write that down. Babylon influences and controls the governments of this world and the economics of this world. Now you see that. Look at Revelation 18 and verse 3. It says this. Revelation 18 and verse 3, it says, For some nations, hmm, it says, All nations, that's global, have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And we know the Proverbs 20 and verse 1 says, Wine is a marker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is. The Bible gives a symbolic usage of the meaning of wine. That wine deceives or wine can represent deception. Just as it can represent pure doctrine, it can also, Proverbs 21.1, represent deception. Truth or error. Fermented wine, error. The pure juice of the grape, truth. Even the doctrines of Christ. It says, all nations have drunk or have partaken of her deception. They've been deceived by her. They've been brought to believe in her falsehoods and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her so we have the deceptions are believed or her position as the mother church or a geopolitical power it's believed by them and also they're in a illicit relationship with her talking about the governments of the world all nations and all the kings thereof with her look at the next party and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her justice. the governments and the merch or the captains of industry the leaders of great financial powers all over the world are waxing rich through the abundance of her delicacy her masses Christmas Easter and other days taken from the pagan world that have been brought into our modern times by Catholic tradition, whether it be Mother's Day, Valentine's, or whatever, Saint Valentine's they call it, all these days are where the greatest amount of sales are made in the world. From Apple computers all the way down to, to uh, Snickers bars, they have tremendous sales around Christmas time. Easter, Mother's Day, Father's Day, all these days are perpetrated, are popularized, and even endorsed by the religious powers of this world. And they've made the merchant of the earth rich. The abundance of her delicacy. Because this connection between the papacy and the economics is important. It's important and it's in their best interest that these powers are connected with her and they're enriched by her and they also enrich her. It's a symbiotic relationship, it's a synergy there between these two powers and also the powers of the government also enriching her and also strengthening her. They say, where do you see that? In the idea of spiritual fornication, we understand this is a relationship between the papal power and the governments and the kings of the earth that is a spiritual fornication according to the scriptures. But what that really means is that the governments are protecting providing financially 
and also giving permissions to the church. Protecting, providing financially, and giving permissions to the church. And I say, how is that spiritual fornication? Because the Bible defines it so. You say, how do you see that? Let's look at some scriptures. Because again, we must understand the economics of the end because there are many churches, many denominations that are not spiritual Babylon, that are in spiritual fornication with the nations. And they are doing a work that's going to cause them to lose their soul salvation and the salvation of their people unless they turn and repent before the Son of Man stands up in the sanctuary above. Notice what it says in the book of 2 Corinthians. Let's see and understand what spiritual fornication is and how it plays into the economics of the end. All nations and the kings have committed fornication and are connected with her through spiritual fornication. How do we understand that to be spiritual fornication? The Bible teaches about this concerning the relationship between a husband and a wife. Does the papacy pretend or pretend, uh, portray itself as a church? Yes, it's recognized as a church, amen? Look at 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians 11, and we look at verse 2, I believe it is. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2. Notice what the Bible says concerning the church, especially if they claim to be the true church, God's church. Notice it says 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2. Say amen when you have that. Amen. 2 Corinthians 11 2 says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to... One. One husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to the church has how many husbands? One, One husband. And that husband is Christ. Christ. But the Bible says all nations have been deceived and the kings of the earth are in fornication with her. The Bible says the true church has one husband, but this church is in an illicit relationship with all the nations and all the kings of the earth. That would be what this a basic understanding, spiritual fornication. But let's even take it a little deeper, look in the scriptures and see what God says about the true relationship between husband and wife or Christ and the church. If this is a claim of being the true church or the church of God as the papacy pretends to be. Look what it says in Titus 2 and verse 5. Now, look now Titus 2 and verse 5. What are we looking for now? Titus. Titus 2 and verse 5. And Titus 2 and verse 5, notice this next scripture, which gives an understanding of the true relationship, which is not being followed by the papacy, which would call the Bible to call the relationship we see prophetically in the end time, spiritual fornication. And from this, we understand how this plays into the economics of the end. If you're still with me, say amen. amen. Okay, I hope you're still with me. Don't say amen, just say amen now. Second, we're going to Titus 2 and verse 5. In Titus 2 verse 5, it says this. Speaking of women, it says, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Now, we know that the word of God says that this woman of the end time has a name upon her head, saying Mystery Babylon, and also written upon the beast is the name of blasphemy. And the Bible says here that the woman was to be what? Discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. What if, what if they're obedient to other people's husbands? What if they're obedient to other men? What if they're following direction, you know? Honey, could you uh, see where the kids are? I'm not seeing where the kids You know, see where the kids are? Jim down the street told me to stay right here, and I'm staying right here. What? <laughs> obedient to their own husbands, in the Lord. But brothers and sisters, this, this woman has a relationship with all the kings of the earth. And she is obeying their directives. She is having them to accredit universities according to her will. To give ideas and principles of how things should be done in their hospitals. You're not following me, brothers and sisters. They're doing relief work for the entire world under various different organizations, but they are NGOs, non-governmental organizations. And they're receiving millions and billions of dollars from America and other governments to do relief work, but at the direction and the obedience to these nations. Now God said, feed the poor, clothe the naked, visit those in prison, 
And basically the Bible said that God said the workman's worthy behind, that he will provide the fund by the cheerful givers, the people of God would provide for these things to be done. But they said, oh, no, no. We'll go to the state and get money to do it. We'll go to the kingdom. And they'll, they'll not only give us the money to do it, but they'll say, they'll say, you know what? Here's some money. I want you to go and do the work that Christ says for you to do. But when you do it, don't say anything about Christ. In other words, because there's a separation of church and state in this government, we can give you the money to do Christ's work, but you can't talk about Christ while you do it. In other words, do this in your husband's name, but don't talk about your husband. Do this in your husband's name with my money, but don't say anything about your husband because we, you're, you're loving, in love with me. You are following my direction. These NGOs, brothers and sisters, are supposedly doing great work, and I won't doubt that they're feeding the poor and causing wells to be created and doing a great work, but at what cost? A cost, as the Bible says here in verse, uh, where are we in 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, we're in Titus 2 and verse 5, where it said that the word of God would be blasphemed. Good works indeed, in a sense, but also the word of God is being blasphemed to do it. And the Bible calls this relationship spiritual fornication. Now look at 1 Peter 3. First Peter, look at this few scriptures. Because again, this is playing into the economics of the end. Billions of dollars going into churches to do good works. Billions of dollars going to churches to build community centers and, and, and nursing homes and all these various things in the name of the state. And I, we call Christian center, it could be called so-and-so Christ, but they can't do any religious work there without risking losing that money because the separation of church and state. The name of God is being blasphemed through the idea of being connected to the government, receiving government funds to do God's work, and you can't even do religious work because of it. In the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, look at 1 Peter 3, I believe it's verse 5 we're looking for. 1 Peter 3, notice what it says here, 1 Peter 3 and verse 5, it says this, 1 Peter 3, 5, say amen when you have that. For after this manner in the old time holy women, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection, subjection unto their Lord. Another scripture talking about how these individuals in the Lord, according to the principle of God, were to be in subjection to listen to the direction of godly husbands. Biblical and contra not contrary advice, these principles will be followed by these holy women or holy churches. But again, brothers and sisters, how many churches have schools that are accredited by the state and not by the Savior? Hospitals that are accredited and following principles of the state and not by the Savior. Principles of education. And even when it comes to doing so-called good works of the work of the church, the church is receiving funds to do all types of feeding programs and, and medical programs that are connected with an given direction directly by the state and not by the principles of the Savior and the spirit of prophecy. For instance, we see the Catholic Church and many denominations, they're following in the train of spiritual fornication according to the biblical rule. Let's look at one last text and then we'll go on. One last text. Please sit up if you will. Ephesians says this. Ephesians. Ephesians 5. Ephesians, the fifth chapter. What were we looking for right here? Ephesians, Ephesians, look at Ephesians, the fifth chapter, Ephesians 5 and verse 28. Ephesians 5 and verse 28. Now how many know, thus far with these scriptures, how clear the difference between the true church and a false church, a pretending church, a church in spiritual fornication is. The Bible is very clear, but look at these texts. Amen. Ephesians says this, Ephesians 5 and verse 28. This is how we, if we don't understand the teaching of the Bible, we can't understand the prophecy. The prophecies are made upon literal local teachings in the Bible. The literal history, the literal teachings, the literal doctrines are used to understand spiritual things. If you don't understand the literal, you can't understand the spiritual. Ephesians says this. Let's, let's, let's close the section with this. Ephesians 5.28. Say amen when you have that. Amen. Ephesians 5.28 it says this. It says, so ought men to love their wives as their own body. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but what? Nourishes and cherishes, even as the Lord the 
Now, what does that mean? It means that the husband is supposed to love and cherish and what does nourish mean? Feed. To feed, to build up. So the whose responsibility is it to feed and to, pro to provide for the woman? It's the husband or Christ. Now the woman could be a millionaire. But it's the husband's responsibility to feed and provide and to cherish the wife. But what if the wife says, you know what? Well, these, these few nickels you give me are good. But, you know, Jim Smith down the street has given me a couple of hundred dollars. Or a couple of thousand dollars. Or a couple. I just have to do what he says. Follow what he tells me to do. That's all right, isn't it? Oh, it's not all right? Well, what you going to do about it? Jim, come, come and take care of my light work. The Bible says that the husband's role is to... So Christ is to provide for the church, amen? amen? Christ is to cherish and to nourish and to build the church. And Christ has afforded a method, a way by which the finances and the forwarding of the gospel is to go forth. Both in his preaching, its benevolent work, its educational work, its healing work, is supposed to be supported by systems of tithe, offering, and gift. The Bible speaks of very clearly. But when the Bible shows this way by which the word of God is blasphemed by this church that calls herself a prophet, going about seeking the aid and the finance and the grants and the, 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 the government aid of the church, sorry, of the state, to support her institutions, and even the work of the civil government to enforce her decrees, then even the Protestant Church of America would form an image, a likeness of the beast. But so we're seeing this everywhere. Not only with Mystery Babylon the Great, but her daughters, the Protestant denominations, are going in this way. You can hardly find a church that has a school or educational system that's not accredited. Based upon the fact that they can't receive the direction of the state to do God's work. Because God, the husband of the, of the church, has told her how to work. And money should not be a reason by which we bend our principles. If not, if we do so, we are tying ourselves into the economics of the end. Doing good works, feeding the poor, making wealth, giving out medicine. These things are good, but God has a way by which we can do it without entangling ourselves and jeopardizing our marriage vows. And by doing so, we're entangling ourselves in the economics of the end. That when this system of things comes down and falls, because we're tied to it, we fall as well. Bar none. No denomination on the earth cannot be, you know, as a matter of fact, I'll, I'll leave that alone. I'll, I'll leave that alone. I'll leave that alone. Let's continue. When we look at the Word of God, we've seen that these concepts of spiritual fornication even clearly show us that the churches of our land, not just the papacy itself, but also the churches of our land are in danger of entangling themselves with the papal power, with the governments of the earth, and preparing ourselves to fall with them because the Bible says all the world will wonder after this beast and also seek the direction and try and follow her, even making an image, a likeness to the bees. Now, let's even go a little bit farther. We talked about the economics of the end, and we talked about not just the governments by which the church is connected with them, both the papal power and many of the Protestant denominations, virtually all. But also we talked about the merchant of the earth being or waxing rich through the abundance of her delicacy. Did we say that? Amen. That was in Revelation 18 and verse 3, I believe. We read that. Amen? Amen. Yeah, some people don't remember that. When we look at what we see in the 18th chapter of Revelation, the antiquated words, the old words, cause us to think this is something of the Old Testament. But the 18th chapter of Revelation is showing us things at the end of time. And even though ancient words and, and terms are used, there are modern equivalents to what we see in the 18th chapter of Revelation. Let's turn there quickly and look at that. Because what we're seeing in Revelation 18 is a future scenario, or a scenario that's taking place and occurs in this world. We say, oh, the old world had all these donkeys and goats and agriculture. Oh, brothers and sisters, the ancient world was just like this world. Just our world is just more sophisticated in a sense, or more polished, but it's the same system. Even a more grander system that must come to naught. In Revelation 18 it says this. Look at Revelation 18, we're going to read verse 11 through 14. Revelation 18, verse 11 through 14, because the merchants of the earth, we're talking about the government and the spiritual fornication. But now it's talking about the merchants of the earth waxing rich with the abundance of her delicacies. And what that means, we're talking about the leaders of the great nations, and sorry, the great, great national uh, empires 
Facebook, Instagram, Google, uh, Exxon Mobil, all these different companies and many more represent tremendous financial interest and we see them outlined and their enterprises outlined in Revelation 18. The 18th chapter of Revelation shows us the world economic landscape. You say, where do you see that? Notice what it says here. In Revelation 18, let's look at verse 11. Are we there? And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. This is a scenario that must take place. This financial system must be accomplished, a one centralized world empire or economic order, but will it last forever? It will come to naught. Let's read on, verse 12. The merchandise of gold and of Silver. Now, if you want to take down notes, write down gold and silver on your page. Can we break this down in a moment? The merchandise of what? And when we talk about merchandise, these are things that can be bought. Merchandise. Bought and sold. And the buying and selling in our modern day is called the world market. Do you have a market here down the street in Publix, Winn-Dixie? We also have a world market. In Publix and Winn-Dixie, things are bought. And so you say, oh, sold? Well, you can go inside, you can, you can sell some things too. You can buy and sell in markets. You can, you say, well, how could you sell them? You can go down there and you can get your orange juice sold in Publix. You can go down there and talk to that, that produce manager and say, hey, I have organic onions. Oh, you do? Oh, no, no, no. Just fill out some paperwork. You can sell onions in Publix and Whole Foods. You just have to have the right connections. You can buy and sell in markets. And some people buy and sell on world markets. Some people buy on national markets. You ever heard of the stock exchange? You ever heard of a, 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 a day of trading? All these terms are dealing with world markets. America has a market, Europe has a market, China, Japan, all these world markets all are dealing with the buying and selling of merchandise, in other words, called commodities. Oh, you know, with Verse 11 says, I'm sorry, verse 12 says, the merchandise of gold and silver. Write in your notes, gold and silver. And precious stones and of pearl. Write down precious stones and pearls. And fine linen. Write down fine linen. Purple, silk, scarlet. And all thionine wood. Write down all wood. And all manner of Vessels of ivory, all manner of vessels, most precious wood, and of brass, and of iron, and marble. Write down vessels, all vessels. Got that? Got it right quick. Number th verse 13. And cinnamon and odors. Write down cinnamon and odors. And ointments. And frankincense, write down ointments. And wine, write down wine. And oil and fine flour and wheat, write down oil. Then write down fine flour and wheat. What's next? Beasts. All right. Write down beasts. And sheeps and horses. And what? Chariots. Write down chariots. And slaves and souls of men. Write down slaves and souls of men. Now you said, what in the world are you doing, Kofi? We're talking about commodities market. We're talking about what's on the stock market today. We're talking about trading in Japan, in China, in Russia, in America, in Europe, in Canada. All the world markets trade in these things. You say, what? Trade in these things? Chariots? Yes. These terms have a modern equivalent. And what we see here is what's being traded on the world market. And people that control these things are the rich men of the earth. You don't believe that? 
Let's go to your list. What's the first thing on your list? Gold and silver. Gold and silver. How about the banking industry? Oh, oh, banks are banked by the government. Banks are private institutions. That's why they got bailed out by government money. Saks Fifth Avenue, Goldman Sachs, AG, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, these billion dollar industries, these are private institutions. These people are making millions of dollars, billions of dollars off of your money. They have the gold and the silver, the most of the gold and silver that people have are in banks or in financial institutions. Raymond James, right? All these 401k investment, retirement packages, uh, bonds, stocks, these things are the gold and silver of this world. And you can connect with that also precious metals because there is a market for precious metals like actual gold, like actual silver, like platinum. These things are another market, the precious metals market. Are oh, we still together? Gold and silver then, but the precious metals market and also the banking industry. All those fees for your ATM card and overdraft, man, they're making millions of dollars off of you. And you say, well, oh, I, I never overdraft. Well, do you have a savings account? You think they're leaving that money inside there? Man, they are going to Vegas and, and blow, they, they are investing that money in everything, pornography. They're investing that money everywhere. Let's digress. Back to our list. Next to the next one. Precious stones, right? And pearls. The diamond market. Both blood diamonds and not. The diamond market. The precious stones. Rubies, diamonds, emeralds. These things are marketing themselves. And they're largely found in Africa. They've been taken from Africa and traded in Europe for hundreds of years. Africa is poor and Europe is rich based upon the commodities of Africa. That's a whole other story into itself. But again, the diamond market, the precious stone market, is a market, a very lucrative market for some rich men and merchants of the earth. And spiritual Babylon gets a percentage of all this. The Bible says these are the things that spiritual Babylon, as delicacies, provides and gives power to the earth and rich men to both enrich them and their self. Pearls, precious stones, Diamond market. Next one says, fine linen. What's that? The textile industry. Now you say, well, who can make money off of, off of textiles or, or sheets, brothers and sisters? Those cheap sheets you're over there buying in Walmart is not, not what we're talking about. We're talking about <laughs> 700 thread count. 800 thread count. You ever had a sheet that was 800 thread count? That means how many, how many threads in a square inch? You know, we have 100 thread count, the thing, take the skin, take the, the hair right off your body, all rough, you can't sleep at night, you know, you're sweating, like, like laying on a, a paper bag. <laughs> One time we went to a meeting and the, and the brother got us a hotel, we were in a big city, got the hotel, thread sheet I think it was 800. Nice. I said, woo, I said, Lord, the Lord is good. Man, I, I jumped in that bed and slid from one side of the bed right on there, hit my head on the, on the window. Thing was so so soft and slick, went right through. Thing was soft. Eight hundred thread count, pillows and sheets, just just it's like butter. I mean, just lie down. You oh, just right asleep. Just, you know, are you turning all night? You oh, just, right asleep. Eight hundred thread count, brothers and sisters. Fine linen, not, the, not Walmart linen, not China linen, fine linen. Silks, right? Fine linen. The textile, both the cheap and the poor, everyone has to, has to get a little cut, but the textile industry is a billion dollar industry. Why? Because they use virtually slave labor. Sweatshops, they're using Vietnam, Haiti, various places to create to sew, to dye, to ship, to package these things, and they make it, it with pennies and sell it for dollars. Textile industry. Next one says all wood. What's all wood? The lumber industry. You say, who can make money off of lumber, brothers and sisters? Uh, how much toilet paper do you use? Where's it come from? How much paper towel do you use? $100 a year on paper towels. 
What are you writing on right now? Well, some people have some iPads out here. What's your Bible made from? Paper. You think people are making money through the lumber industry? If you could sell wood, sell trees, they're cutting down trees faster than they can grow them. And such is causing the whole climate of the earth to be changed. Now, people will argue that pollution is not causing, oh, there's no global warming. But let's put, let's put pollution aside and look at the cutting down of trees all over the world. That doesn't affect the oxygen and the climate of the entire world. But again, the Bible said he'll destroy those that destroy the earth. These people mining for diamonds, these people mining for gold and silver, these people mining or trying to take down wood, they're destroying the earth. Another sermon unto itself. Fine linen is the textile industry. It is traded daily on the world markets. All vessels, all vessels, what are vessels? Vessels are containers, whether it be vases or cups or bowls or so on, whether they be for art or whether they be for usages in uh, uh, homes and so on, the counters, sinks, all these things. It says all vessels, brass, marble, all these things are fine vessels. And they're various, but even luggage could fall into that as well. All these things are tremendous industry, especially if you're talking about ivory and marble. People spend top dollar for these things. Traded on world markets. Next one says cinnamon and odors. I'm not about cinnamon, maybe talking about some cinnamon, you know, crunch uh, bagel or something like that. We're talking about <laughs> perfumes. Yeah. Perfumes. How much for five, six, ten ounces of perfume? Hundreds of dollars, some of these things. Some perfumes, even you can pay five, six, a thousand dollars. I was in the mall the other day, I had to go to the bathroom. Usually when I go to the bathroom, I go to Saks Fifth Avenue. I go to the fancy bathrooms. You know, I don't go down to, uh, you know, you know, uh, McDonald's. McDonald's bathroom, Burger King. You know, I'm in the mall, I go to uh, Saks Fifth Avenue or, you know, one of these big, big time bathrooms, you know. So I can relax. <laughs> Went in the bathroom, and there was a brother coming out. Now, now the brother was, you know he's rich. The brother had on a, a, a Rolex, the bezel was all diamond encrusted. You know, just, I mean, dressed to the nines. I mean, nice, you know, shirt on, you know, crisp, you know, pants, shoes, everything, pristine. And the brother had on the perfume. And I was like, brother, smell like the, like the, the, the Sheik of Arabic. I'm like, what, what's this? Is Solomon here? I mean, I said, what in the world? I mean, this, this was an incredible smelling perfume. And as I walked through, the, the smell was continued. Down. There were two guys coming out of the bathroom. And the guy coming out of the bathroom said, do you smell that guy? Man, that, that was delicious. The man said that was delicious. I said, mercy, these two men that actually said this man's perfume was delicious. I mean, the, it was incredible. But again, how much do you think he probably, caught, where did he get that from and how much do you think he paid for this incredible smell? Probably a thousand dollars, if not more. These perfumes that you can find over in Europe and places sometimes cost a thousand dollars. And they're made largely, some of the best ones, from something called ambergris. You know what ambergris is? Whales vomit it into the sea. It's a, it's, a, it's a substance that whales vomit out and it's found floating in the sea. And it's very, very rare to find it, but when they find it, they make perfumes from it. Ambergris. Go and look it up online. Next time you just <laughs> whale vomit. <laughs> Next one says ointments. Ointments. What are ointments? Medicines. Medicines. Is the pharmaceutical industry, the medical industry, have billions of dollars. Mm. Medicines, pharmaceuticals, not even mention creams and lotions that people use so in abundance, but I'm talking about medicines, the pharmacies, the, the pharmacia, by which you deceive the whole world. These things are billions of dollars. Some of the medications that people have now that they're trying to get for different diseases, they can't even afford them. A hundred dollars, five hundred dollars a pill. Trade on the world markets. Next it says wine. Is alcohol a big business? Mm -hmm. Are these alcohol companies trading in billions of dollars? Are they government sanctioned to poison you, cause accidents, maiming, destroying? People die of drunk drivers all the time. Do they sue the alcohol companies? Strange, isn't it? Next thing says oil. It's okay, some olive oil. No, let's leave that. Let's talk about petroleum. How much does the oil market affect the entire world? Right now, as we're speaking, there's a great tension in the Strait of Hormuz. You know what the Strait of Hormuz is? It's over there near Iran, in the Middle East. It's a small area in which you pass through on Iran on one side, 
in another country, the Middle East, on the other side, it's a, straw, a small strait that you pass into the Mediterranean Gulf. You can't get in or out of the Mediterranean, you can't get to these nations to actually get their oil and bring their oil out without the Strait of Hormuz. I think Iran's on one side and I think, oh, what's that another country? Because I remember I, Iraq actually invaded them and that's what brought the first Gulf War. The, 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 the country escaped me, but there's two countries on either side and the waterway passed through is very small and hundreds of ships passed through bringing a majority of the world's oil out of the Mediterranean, out of the Persian Gulf into not just the Mediterranean, I mean the Persian Gulf, out of the Persian Gulf into the markets of the world. And because of the idea that there may be war and there may be a blockade of the Strait of Hormuz, gas prices are going to, and are starting to climb because of fear and speculation on the world markets. Oil is a major commodity. Talking about the economics of the end, amen? Fine, wheat, flour, right? Baked goods. Panera Bread, Wonder Bread, Intamins, Dunkin' Donuts, Krispy Kreme, all these industries, even, can you have McDonald's without the, without the, the buns? How about Taco Bell without the, without the uh, tacos? And the tortillas? How about Wendy's without the, without the how, about, how about any of these countries, uh, uh, companies that have all these great products, even foods, without fine flour, sure. without baked goods. Even in the time of Joseph, it was the baker who was in prison. Mm. That, was, that, that might have been a financial move, not just a, a, a temporal move, that might have been a financial move. And the Bible says that fine flour and wheat, food, providing food to the world is a major industry. Beasts. How about the meat and dairy industry? Not just looking at, not, we're talking about just, you know, puppies, we're talking about meat, we're talking about cattle, we're talking about even the various beasts, even the fishes of the sea, the, 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 the fowls of the air, these things being traded and this is the meat and dairy industry, the poultry industry, billions of dollars, lobbies in Washington DC and makes millions of dollars to people to keep their products on the market and keep down or try to suppress the idea of disease in animals and the various large amounts of ointments or medicines used to keep these animals alive because of leukemia and various diseases that are proliferating throughout the herds. This is a, something that the, 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 the power of the papacy would like to keep suppressed so that these powers can continue to be enriched by the abundance of these delicacies. So the next one is chariots. Chariots, conveyances. What's that? Automobile industry. Transportation industry. Ford, Jaguar, Hyundai, Toyota, Mercedes-Benz. Can I throw a, what's that, electric car? Tesla. Tesla inside, how do you know about that? Over there looking, driving around, driving, testing one out. Tesla, all these cars are making billions of dollars. Last it says slaves and souls of men. You say, well, that's not happening right now. Brothers and sisters, do you know that the prison systems are trading on the stock market nowadays? And the idea of convict leasing that happened shortly after slavery and Jim Crow has been reignited here in the last days as the pen administration told us it would be to bring about a system where a great amount of, of people of color, of African descent, are in prison than were in slavery in 1863, free by emancipation. Today, a greater number, a greater million of, are in prison. And in these prisons, they're pressing out license plates. And this five to 10 cents piece of tin with maybe two cents worth of paint on it, how much does a license plate cost? So, 25, 30 cents worth of tin, and the state is charging $100 for it. And who's making it? Prison. They're making wood, I mean, they're making furniture, license plates, and all, you know what they're getting? Pennies, the same amount of money that they're getting in Haiti, in Vietnam, in these different places, in parts of China, in the slave labor there. Brothers and sisters, you may say, oh, these people have done evil. They're, they're there and they have to, to work out their, their penance. But there's a difference between working out your penance 
and doing your, 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 your bid or your, 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 your uh, restitution to society and slave labor. Slavery is under another name, slavery still. And this is going to be much wider than we think. Now also, let's say that we don't also understand that there is still a Islamic slave trade that has never stopped. The European slave trade stopped, but the Islamic slave trade continues to this day. You can go right now to places like Libya and various places and buy Africans today. Today. But all these things are traded, that we talked about today, are traded on the world markets. On the world markets. And these things enrich the kings of the earth, enrich the merchants of the earth, and they enrich the papacy. And these things all must come together in a unified, one world, central government, even digitally though, traded, commodified, so that there can be, according to Revelation 13, not only a death decree, but also a system by which that people can not buy or sell, save they had the mark of the beast, the name, and the number of the beast. Shall we close with this thought? Look at three scriptures. This system must come together so that this can happen. The merchants of the earth are all on board with making more money. Having their money instantly transferred. You know how many people lose money because of bad checks? Having digital transfer is very effective, very lucrative. They desire that more than checks. Even going paperless saves them billions of dollars. It's in the interest of companies to have a digital connection. Amen? But notice, what it's, notice a few scriptures. Look at how all this must come together. Let's look first at the governments of the world. Look at Revelation. Will the governments of the world unite together and give economic, financial, spiritual, temporal power to the papacy? Look at Revelation chapter 17. Amen. In Revelation 17, notice what it says. And we studied this a few nights ago. Let's put on our thinking cast and go back in our mind to the 17th of Revelation, looking at verse 12 through 14. Because all the governments of the world, all the kings, nations, are going to unite and give their power, economic, civil, social, to this system. Since the image in America, it will go universal. It says this, Revelation 17 and verse 12. It says in Revelation 17, 12, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Who's the beast? Papacy. Papacy. Receive their kingdom one hour with the beast. And we understand who these ten kings are from a previous study. Verse 13. These have what? One mind. One mind with the beast. Mm -hmm. And shall give their power. What kind of power? What kind of power do governments have? Economic. Military. Social. Right? Power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, verse 14, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and a King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. All the world is going to wonder, and especially these ten kings are going to give their power. The European powers and the idea of Brexit is going to come to naught. The idea of a European Union must take place, both financially and spiritually that this system may come to pass. But here we see the Bible says they have one mind and they'll give their power. What about America? The Bible says it will give their power and strength. It will happen at a, at a national level, at a governmental level. What about the mercy of the earth? Look at the book of James. What about the rich man? Look at James now. What book are we looking for? James. James. We're looking at the New Testament, looking for the book of James in the back of your Bible. At the book of Hebrews, the book of James. James. Look at James, the fifth chapter. We're almost done. James 5. James, the fifth chapter. James 5, verses 1 through 7. Are all the kings, the ten kings, European powers, going to unite, even though Brexit seems so strong? Will they unite? Yes. Will they give all their power? Yes. Will they come to naught? Yes. What about the rich men? What about the merchants of the earth? What will they do? Will they have economic success? And will it come to naught? James chapter 5, verses 1 through 7 says this. James chapter 5, 1 through 7. It says, Go to now ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Future. 
Prophetic, right? Your riches are? What corrupted mean? No good. Spoiled. Unusable. No good, right? Your riches are corrupted and your garments are? Their righteousness are moth eaten. The Bible says that these things will come to naught. Rich men, super rich, but their riches will fail. They will be destroyed. They'll come to naught. Verse 3, your gold and silver, the economics, is cankered. And the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the do you know that also since 1989, since 1990, these prophecies have come to true in a greater way? You say, well, oh, there's always been rich men. Not like it has since 1990. Not, you say, well, there was, there was a, uh, uh, I think it was some rich people back in the day. Uh, J.P. Morgan and all these various people back in the day that were super wealthy. There have been more millionaires and billionaires made in the last 30 years than all the whole time America has been in existence. There have been more millionaire. The Bible doesn't say go to ye one rich man. It talks about ye rich men. A body of rich men that have heaped and gathered treasures when? For the last days. When are we looking at the last day? Daniel 11 told us it would be when this papal power comes back against the king of the south and starts to move to the countries and to the glorious land and take control of the finances. Then we know we're in a time when these prophecies are coming to pass and we have seen, for instance, 30 years ago, let's say 20 years ago, yeah, 20 years ago, how much money did How much money did uh, Mark Zuckerberg have? When he's sleeping on, on someone's futon and, and someone's bed, you know. Now he's a billionaire. One of the richest men in the world. And a lot of the people that are with him are also billionaires. 30 years ago, let's say, mm, let's say uh, 1985, somewhere around there. How much money did Bill Gates have? He was probably sleeping on someone's couch too. Now Warren Buffett, he might have been a millionaire back then. He might have been a millionaire back then. But Warren Buffett is now a billionaire. They've heaped together treasure. The amount, the number of billionaires and millionaires, especially because of the gig economy or this digital economy or Silicon Valley or the infrastructure that is going to help create this digital one world financial order. This has caused a super abundance of millionaires and they all gathered their money together for the last days. Look at verse 4. The higher your labor that reap down your fields which kept back by fraud crieth. So there's going to be some rich men but also a lot of fraud and deception like Enron, like Tyco, like all these different companies, like Bernie Madoff who made off with a whole bunch of money. All this have come to condemn them for the last thing. Look at verse 7 to show you even the context of when this happens. This happens right before what? Verse 7 says, Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, this financial order, this one world government, this one world financial system is already practically in place. It only needs, like the image, to have life breathed into it and to go cashless and to block out or lock out anyone who does not go along with the Sunday movement. All we need, brothers and sisters, is to have the Sunday movement come upon us. The, the system is here. It only needs to have life breathed into it to block out or to keep out anyone who will not go along with this Sunday movement movement. We are close to a Sunday law and close to the same system by which people we keep out of it. But as soon as they achieve this Sunday law, and as soon as they try to take this stuff internationally, guess what happens? The whole economy crashes. This treasure or this economy, it becomes corrupted. The Bible says that individuals are seeing the, the instability in the world and these rich men that are seeing and making all this money, guess what they're doing with this money? Guess what a lot of people are doing with this money? Guess what a lot of people that are 
industry captains are doing with their billions that they get cash out of Facebook, and they cash out of Instagram, they cash out of Google and these places, and they're seeming to disappear. Where are they going? Can I get this two seconds? Give me, give me two minutes to deal with that before we close our last day. Give me two minutes to deal with that. The Bible says that a lot of these individuals would start a movement that's prophetically seen. Look what it says in the book of Revelation. In Revelation, we're going to see a lot of the rich men and these captains of the earth, even some of the bondmen that Revelation 13 talks about, are going to take themselves and because of the political and economic, see, you got, got to preach, he's, I can't even preach anymore, he's talking so much. Amen. Thank you, Mom, for taking him out. So I can finish the economics at the end. <laughs> He's preaching the everlasting gospel. I'm trying to preach the economics at the end. In the book of Revelation, we see that the Bible teaches that there is going to be a movement as people see the financial and economic instability. And there are many financial people, money people are seeing where these things are tended, knows what they're going to do. And knows what they're even doing right now. In the book of Revelation chapter 6, Revelation 6 it says this. In Revelation 6 and verse 15, notice what the Bible says. It says, and the kings. Revelation 6, 15. Are we there? Amen. Revelation says the kings of the earth, the nations of the earth, the merchants. Notice what they're going to do and what they're doing even now. It says, and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bond man and every free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains and said that the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand? Brothers and sisters, there is a definite application of a, a people in the last days that will see Christ and run from it. That is not going to be anywhere doubted by prophetic teachers and preachers. But the Bible said the individuals are going to hide themselves in the den and rocks. They're going to make themselves dens. What's a den? It's a home. It's a lair. It's a dwelling place. In the rocks, in the mountains, underground. Ever heard of doomsday preppers? People spending millions of dollars to make underground houses or to have escape tunnels from their above ground house into a nuclear fallout center or a what they call a bug out location where they have food and water and guns and ammunition and medicines and and spaghettios and so on for, for years to come to survive all types of attack a nuclear attack political unheaval of people social financial distress they have prepared themselves sometime million dollar complexes underground to do this. this is a very popular trend and just look at Isaiah. Isaiah 2 shows that this trend is because these people have no fear of God in their heart, but they have the fear of things coming from the earth. Their hearts are failing them for fear, and all they can do is try to ask the mountains to fall upon them and to protect them from what's coming upon the earth. What are we looking for in the book of Isaiah? Amen? Isaiah. Isaiah, the second chapter. Isaiah 2. Notice what it says here. Isaiah saw the same scene and notice what Isaiah says. Isaiah says this. Isaiah, the second chapter. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 16. Isaiah 2, 16. It says, And upon the ships of Tarshish. Now, brothers and sisters, you know the ships of Tarshish and the ships of Chitem or Shitem are merchants, right? You do know that. You know that prophetic. Okay. And upon the ships of Tarshish, and upon all pleasant pictures, and the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the hornness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day, and all the idols shall, he shall utterly abolish. Listen carefully. And they shall go into the holes of the rocks, and into the caves of the earth, for fear of the Lord, and for the glory of his majesty, when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. The economics, the governments, the social order, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And people are seeing it and they're going and making preparation for the apocalypse. Verse 20. And in that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they have made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats, to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake terribly the earth. Now, brother and sister, you said these idols of gold and the idols of silver, the Bible said you cannot worship God and mammon. 
You cannot worship God, either you're going to worship God or you're going to worship, what's mammon? Gold and silver. These idols of gold and silver, these captains of industry, many of them worship the God of money, the God of gold and silver. They, how do you know we worship? The Bible said, thou shalt not worship or serve other God. Some would say, well, I don't worship these things, but you serve them. You're all your time and energy and, and emphasis and strength and intellectual power and your happiness is being poured into making money. You are subject to your mortgage more than you are to the maker of heaven and earth. You're subject to the creation and, 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 and development and furthering and uplifting of financial power than spiritual power. And captains of industry spend much of their time getting, acquiring, and taking gains, capital gains. They worship gold and silver. And when all things come to naught and the economy closes, they are going to take the gold and silver and cast it to the moles in the back. Why? Because it's useless now. It's corrupted. It has become moth-eaten. It has failed. It, the money means nothing. And all they can do is hide in the rocks and the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and the terrible shaking of the earth. The financial order, the spiritual order, all things, when Babylon starts to fall, all things social, economic, political come to no, the world is in a terrible state right before the falling of the plague. Let's close here. We're closing here. We don't want to take too much time. We've already preached too long. We've preached too long. Look at Daniel 11. Let's close. In Daniel 11, it says this. Let's look at this last little part, and then we're closing. We're talking about the economics of the end. We're in Daniel 11. Daniel 11 chapter. And again, let's read what we read and then show you something important because this economic order and this acquisition of and centralizing the economies of the world to lock out all the people of God that do not worship the beast and its image must be accomplished. But when it's accomplished, notice what happens. Look what it says here in Daniel 11 and verse 43. It says, but he shall have power. Are we there? Amen. But he shall have power over the treasures of the gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans and Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Verse 44. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble the papacy. Therefore shall they go forth with great fury to kill, death decree, and utterly to make away. What are the, what are the, what are the tidings? What are the glad tidings? The gospel. Tidings out of the east and out of the north. Hmm? Out of the east? Where does Jesus come from? The east. And the Bible said, Jesus said, as lightning shine from the east, even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. The everlasting gospel must be preached from the east to the west. The principles showing the coming of the soon coming of Christ or the seventh day and Adventism must be preached from the east to the west. And also the north, the side of the north, the city of the great king, is the coming of Christ with the New Jerusalem as well. That's where Mount Zion is. That's where the church is. Tri sightings out of the east and out of the north trouble the papacy. This is the loud cry coming. This is the work of God coming with great glory because now as this economic system has been put in place and we have a law that is enforcing the power of God upon the power of the God of this earth, I should say, upon the people, now God pours out this Holy Spirit upon those that are ready and the message goes with great power out of the east, now the north, and the trouble begins upon the papacy and he turns to trouble the people. Brothers and sisters, we are not in 1989, or 1990, probation hasn't closed as yet. We are a few short months, a few short days, a few short weeks away from all these things coming to pass. And we must understand and make preparation practically, spiritually, and even intellectually to stand amid the economics of the end. If your desire to spiritually stand by knowing the gospel and receiving Jesus Christ today, if your desire to understand the principles prophetically and practically, that you can stand both in health, in holiness, 
and have a ministry, let us ask God at this time for these blessings. Because these are precious promises He's given us to encourage us and support us and strengthen us at this time are needful. We need the gospel. We need the promises of Psalm 91. We need the promises and the practical instruction given by prophecy that we may reform and revive and stand in the liberty where God has made us free in these economics of the end. Let's pray together on that wise. Father, you've given us promises in your word and we thank you for the promises of God that show us the economics of the end. And I need a preparation for that time even this morning. Give us this day our daily bread. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Lord, we pray that we would not run to the ragged rocks and to the hills to have them fall upon us, but we would be making preparation to stand and to give a witness to all the world. Lord, teach us, show us, order our steps in thy word. Prepare us for the times ahead, even the time of trouble as we spiritually understand who you are and intellectually understand the Trinity's message and believe, building our faith, that we may stand in the end times amid the beast, the mark, his image, and all these spiritual pressures give us a unwavering faith as we start today. Choosing you, believing you, loving you, receiving you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.